in the western world there is something called as music healing so let's say you're unwell so if you actually listen to certain music for so many hours a day you will be surprised that element goes away that's where bhajan comes in so you need to have emotions and you should have intelligence also mm. so bhajans invoke that particular thing that's why you have this different musical instruments different ragas and they invoke those particular bhav in you be careful next time you will see some lemon being there or maybe some you know vegetable with some colors around it and all don't go near it you mean like a plastic bag yes with- Really? Yeah. Don't even go behind it. You never know what they have invoked and put it on the road. You see this a lot in Indian cities. Oh, especially tied to cities. Really? Like yeah. you just see some food lying down on the yes, road. Yes, yes. In yes. a closed plastic bag. I've always assumed that someone's left it for beggars to eat. No, no, no. You never know. So something which is unknown because what power they have put into that, you don't know. So over the course of three years of running the show, we've spoken to scientists, we've spoken to astronauts, actors, sports people. entrepreneurs people from all walks of life but the data tells us that the hottest most requested podcasts are related to dark concepts like black magic like ghosts like the occult in general this is another conversation just like that but with a slight spiritual bent we broke down the four vedas this is a fantastic introductory podcast to the subject of indian scriptures This is Dr. Radha Krishnan Pillai who returns on TRS once again. Make sure you follow TRS on Spotify. Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Dr. RKP returns as an all-star on TRS once again. Dr. Radha Krishnan Pillai, welcome back to TRS. It's always an honor sharing this platform with TRS, of course, with you, Ranveer. And what lovely conversations we had in the past. And thanks to the audience for giving us so many likes, of course, shares, and of course, meeting us and giving us so much positive feedback. Looking forward for this show also. Yeah, I think uh, yourself, Abhijit Chawla, Luke Coutinho, these three people have their own cult followings when it comes to this show. the switch up recently is that now we are making the show for international audiences as well it's gone beyond india india has always been a knowledge capital sir uh, i think the world knows about the bhagavad gita the mahabharat the ramayan what people don't know about is the texts that came before these texts the texts that have mystical elements and the texts that have um, talk about ghosts and talk about soma and talk about psychedelics and talk about all these occult practices occult practices we're talking about the vedas in this one so i don't even know where to begin the story so you help me out where do we begin i will begin with the story okay so first of all vedas are called as a purusheya so let me explain that to you a purusha means not written by men not written by men or human beings purusha means human beings without the help of human beings vedas have been created so it was created by like an alien race no i would say you know let's look at the other way let's say you have a camera okay somebody created it and if that particular person wants to make a manual how to use it properly so it is the whole universe is created by god so it is said that god only created the vedas but of course he used one human being and he was uh, uh, appointed to write down the vedas So the knowledge is in the universe. That person downloaded it, and the name of that person is Veda Vyas, mm. whose birthday we celebrate as Guru Purnima. Mm. So we recently had Guru Purnima, and you'd be surprised. Veda Vyas is not the writer of Vedas or creator of Vedas. He is the one who actually compiled it and wrote it in human language. Okay. So if you look at the internet today, it's all there. You can't feel the internet, but you can use the internet. Mm. So the Vedas are actually knowledge of the universe. So uh, what I have understood is that the Bhagavad Gita is a compilation of the four Vedas. Is that accurate? No. No. Actually, Bhagavad Gita is a part of Mahabharat, but it contains the essence of the Upanishads. How is the Bhagavad Gita and Vedas related? It's not related at all. So I would say they are all interconnected, but Bhagavad Gita is a part of Mahabharat. So okay. let me go back and say there are actually four Vedas. Hmm. classified the whole knowledge the first one is called rig ved sam ved yajur ved and of course we have the atharva ved where all the occult practices and lot of rituals are mentioned there are all different methods of reaching the same god 
different yeah. methods methods so yeah. you can just study one very well and still get Absolutely. moksha nirvana but let us not forget to have the guidance of a guru while we are studying it why because reading a book doesn't give you knowledge discussion with a master gives you the knowledge where where would you like to begin this explanation of the vedas like which one would you like to start with rigved the first one okay so during those days they used to invoke natural elements in fact rigveda starts with invoking agni that is fire god okay invoking means inviting i think both can be the common word invoking inviting is the same for example in india even today the first god that is worshiped is actually fire god you mean when you are doing a puja like when you are praying yeah, you light a house diya. warming weddings hmm. what do you keep agni sakshi hmm. what does so, sakshi mean as a witness okay. so when we are you know doing any ceremony it is fire god that is invoked mm. in rigveda the first god that is invoked is actually fire god mm. but of course there are elements you can see that in western movies the five elements and all so water is there fire is there vayu is there mm. so in fact if you look at the indian navy if you look at their logo it talks about shanno varuna varuna means sea or water god Mm. So in the Rig Veda, we invoke the natural powers of natural elements. So how would you kind of explain the Rig Veda from a macro perspective? What what is in that overall book? Like, if I had to explain autobiography of a yogi, I'd say that it's a good introduction to the world of yoga and spirituality. What's the Rig Veda? So Rig Veda is the introduction to the powers of the natural element which you can invoke in your life and inside your own body as well. Yes, of course, because let's say I require a particular temperature. If it goes down or if it goes higher then i am not well you mean your body has a natural temperature it is yes. 37.5 if i'm yes, not mistaken yes, yes, degree yes, celsius yes, yes. but uh, if there's too much heat in your body say you're eating too much spicy food you're yes. eating a lot of meat you're eating processed food heat increases yes the rigved possibly has yogic techniques yes. or food yes. knowledge food information about foods that cools down your body yes. parallelly if your body is too cold it has information about how to heat up your body but what else beyond just fire and temperature so there are many natural elements so they are all invoking the different nature elements okay. so okay. that's rigved okay what's that deeper in the book like when you say invoking are there is there a list of mantras yes okay maybe for the western audiences can you explain what a mantra is yeah so mantra is something that you discover to invoke the natural elements for example if you see in any puja there is a particular pandit ji who will invoke that lord okay here's how i understand mantras um i used to look down upon bhajans the word bhajan is basically you can think of it the, the catholic parallel the christian parallel is hymn you know like hymn religious yes. songs yes. i used to question what the logic behind that is as i grew older and i discovered bhajans and kirtans i've realized that they all made in very particular tunes yes and if you sing along or if you even hum along with it it kind of changes your breathing pattern slightly your breath always has an effect on your heartbeat and your heartbeat always has an effect on your perception of reality because it affects your mind yes therefore bhajans affect how calm you feel usually they usually calm you down oh interestingly we have heard about astral travel and also planchets okay. heard about planchets no no so what happens in the western culture suppose you have to invoke a dead soul you can actually invoke them and get them in a physical form like vija boards Yeah, Ouija boards. Exactly. Mm. So let me give an example in the Mahabharat. How were the five Pandavas born? So their ma- mother Kunti actually could invoke the devatas. So if you look at it, there was no biological way of you know producing these children. So how did they happen? So all these five Pandavas were actually the children of gods. So Kunti had the power of invoking the mantras and these particular gods. Mm. So if you look at, for example, Bhim. Bhim is supposed to be Vayu Putra, coming back to Rig Veda. The so, son of wind. Wind, and he is the brother of Hanuman, who is also son of wind. Hmm. So she invokes, and then Hanuman ji is not born. But in this particular case, we have Bhim Bhim born. Hmm. So these five Pandavas were actually born to Kunti by invoking through these mantras. Hmm. In fact, it is said that there are different eras. Like today, we are living in a digital era. During the Mahabharat or the Vedic era, it was a full era of mantras. Okay. I'll give an example. You know, if you look at the Mahabharata war, you must have seen some television serials. They never had missiles like what we make today. They could take a blade of grass and they would invoke a mantra, and that particular blade of grass actually became a missile, hmm. a Brahmastra. 
सो ब्रह्मास्त्र इज नॉट द डिस्कवरी ऑफ ए मिसाइल और द इन्वेंशन ऑफ ए मिसाइल इन अ पर्टिकुलर लेबोरेटरी लाइक मॉडर्न डे वॉरफेयर इट इज एक्चुअली इन्वर्किंग द मंत्रास एंड गिविंग द पावर टू दैट लिटिल ब्लेड ऑफ ग्लास विच कैन एक्चुअली एक्ट एस एन एरो लेट्स टॉक अबाउट ब्रह्मास्त्र लिल वेट बिकॉज नाउ दैट्स द हॉट टॉपिक सो ब्रह्मास्त्र इज मूवी बींग क्रिएट बाय अयान मुखर्जी इट हैज रणबीर कपूर एन आलिया बट इट एम्स टू काइंड ऑफ आई वॉन्ट कॉल इट गिव इंडिया इट्स ओन सुपर हीरो जॉनर बट इट्स गिविंग इंडिया इट्स ओन cultural genre because they are inspired from ancient indian culture yeah. which contains a lot of elements related to superheroes and superpowers and mystical elements just like this uh in the mahabharat there is a particular weapon called the brahmastra which i believe arjun who's the main hero basically of the mahabharat in some ways would you say while there's a bunch of heroes he's supposed to be the most fearsome warrior and the the best at warfare and he comes out at the top in the end he gets the brahmastra as a gift from shivji from shiva after meditating over it uh, after performing some kind of penance but shivji i believe only gives him a limited number one or two of them or something like that if i correct me if i'm wrong sir um and he tells arjun to only use it when it's truly required now parallelly arjun's uh, guru dronacharya has also got a brahmastra of his own now eventually in the war arjun has to face his own guru because of circumstance during the course of the 18 day war the guru uh, dronacharya is killed but he gives his brahmastra to his son ashwatthama once the war is done arjun and the pandavas are victorious ashwatthama is the only enemy of theirs who still alive after the war and as a form of revenge he decides to use the brahmastra on the last uh, heir to the pandavas so ashwatthama is responsible for killing all the children of the pandavas all the grandchildren but there's one particular uh, wife of abhimanyu who was the son of arjun who's still alive after ashwatthama's attack and she's pregnant at the time and he takes the brahmas and targets it at her belly and i think he fires it as well uh he's able to kill the wife the child and krishna who's the uh, avatar of vishnu at that point curses him and un- undoes his act he basically brings the child and the mother back to life i think it's just the child back to life i, I don't remember the exact details but uh, he curses ashwatthama saying the kind of pain you've created you're going to have to face this pain for eternity and uh, he kind of gives him an injury on his forehead and also turns him immortal he says that immortality along with this pain will be your curse for what you've done he brings the child back to life and that child who uh, face the brunt of the brahmastra eventually becomes the heir to the pandavas and he continues the legacy i don't remember the... so i will continue the story yeah sure the Go name ahead. of the child is parikshit parikshit what does that mean pariksha okay exam. examining so i'll tell you it is absolutely right brahmastra is the most powerful weapon Hmm. it can destroy anything and everything okay so as you rightly pointed out it's like a nuclear weapon in today's generation hmm. look at what happened to hiroshima and nagasaki hmm. and now all over the world people are saying don't use the nuclear weapon it's a very 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 rare case that you should use it so ashwatthama used it but krishna was so angry that he said wait so he protects the child and when the child comes out he is looking out who was my protector that's why pariksha karne wala as they say he was examining he was actually looking out for krishna so that's how the name parikshit comes in okay so uh, this is me switching off as the podcaster and just becoming a student of radha sir uh, you dealt with a very important life event less than 6 months ago i don't want to say anything why don't you just share it with the audience yourself so i'll tell you i had a small issue just you know 6 months back it so happened that you know i started throwing up vomiting and then uh, it was not stopping there was nothing in my stomach so my wife and my friends and everybody took me to a hospital fortunately the doctor is also a student of mine so they diagnosed it and saying that you know the because of the bp being shot up it affected my brain there was a small bleeding and i was hospitalized for 10 days and then of course i came out thanks to the doctors the whole team and the whole family of course my wife sureka helped me recover but i realized one very important thing you know i recovered so fast because of two things one is the spiritual thing my father told me you know remember this is a positive thing imagine if i had got this maybe when i was 80 you know it could have been fatal 
but you'll be surprised i lost lot of weight i came back into that positive state of mind and believe me it is only because of the spiritual practice that my health is recovered meeting your father is also its own experience sir taking away nothing from the experience that you had like meeting your father is just mystical almost like he's got this very different energy about him yes. always got peace and happiness joy on his face he meditates 8 hours a day 8 to 10 hours 10 hours a day uh how did he take this whole health situation happening same thing like me when he was around 45 years old he went through a health element and he was hospitalized i still remember i was a child hardly in fourth or fifth standard and that time he discovered that you know he need to go into the spiritual path so today is 88 years old and he climbed the himalayas were you in pain when this was happening no not at all there was no physical pain but you were in hospital ha uh, but you know because i had a spiritual bent of mind my doctor asked me first how do you visualize yourself i said i am visualizing myself as more stronger and fitter after this i think that's how you should be remember one thing whenever you are sick it is not the body or the doctor alone it's the state of mind that you and if you visualize yourself to be perfectly fine you will become in fact i just want to say that you know when i was not well nase rog hare sab pira japat nirantar hanumat veera so nase rog so the elements of disease will go away if you continue to chant hanuman ji mm. so believe me that is only one part of the whole hanuman chalisa mm. we know of so many people i know of an experiment being done by a rishi rishi means a fine friend of mine who is a scientist is a sanskrit scholar so you know i told him there is one person who is not well then said give me his background so he was almost in the stage of death he went back to the vedas he found out a particular mantra and he chanted it over 7 days and the person recovered back to health so mantras can be generic and mantras can be specific mm. in fact you know if you look at the rituals that we follow in our particular culture it is actually getting that positive vibe so let me give an example if you look at uh, the vastu shanti that we do so when you do a housewarming ceremony in our country so we do a vastu puja what is a vastu puja so vastu is a space so the pandit ji will come he will invoke ganesh ji you do those mantra chanting and they say wow because you know whenever you have to freshen up you go and take a bath what about the space hmm. you actually do this mantra chanting another example of you know making anything pure and divine is through certain rituals like for example in weddings we have this vedic weddings where you know there is a mantra being chanted and all so please understand mantras are very scientific but we need to get a good scientist hmm. who can explain this to us hmm. or at least someone who's educated yes about these rituals you know i think rituals generally with people my age definitely with people younger than me have a very bad name because people associate rituals with um uh, godmen like you know god how godmen have a bad name in our country uh people associate rituals with old school thinking now i'll tell you what the problem is i've identified the reality so you know in my parents generation understood rituals as shraddha just have faith in godmen or that pandit ji but your generation is a highly educated generation you want logic and if the pandit ji is not able to explain it logically you don't have faith in it mm. so initially it worked with faith but today it is working with logic first and then faith later so that was the rig ved huh. where we went on these tangents about mantras which is the veda that you want to talk about next so second is sama ved now the sama ved is very interesting it talks about music just music so music and different format so if you want to be in the artist side this is the veda for you in fact all our compositions are in poetic formats So if you look at all the Upanishads, if you look at the Rama and Mahabharat, they are all poems. So you will be surprised. So Sama Ved is something about music. What is music? What What is music for you? Like now everyone knows what music is. It's these tunes, words put together, and you say it in a certain frequency, and that becomes music. But what about ancient human beings? What so if you look at the Indian them? classical music, they are connected to nature, and the easiest form to understand is ragas. Okay, so there is a morning raga, there is an evening raga, there is an afternoon raga. Again, probably the logic behind this is that the ragas are made in a particular tune, which controls your breath if you take part in it, which controls your heartbeat, which controls your mind. So it's again for meditative purposes. Uh, a friend of mine, Arman Malik, he's a very big uh, playback singer in Bollywood. He was talking to me once about how his riyaz practice, just training his throat to be able to become a better singer, and riyaz is also one of those meditative practices that can. help you evolve spiritually and make you a better musician it works exactly like meditation 
can you believe this you pointed out something nice the practice of a musician and the practice of a spiritual seeker has got a common word called sadhana really so when you say you are practicing music actual guru will tell you sadhana karo so that music is not just practicing or making your throat better it's actually reaching you towards god it's a discipline it's a discipline uh, that's basically what riyaz is that yes uh, riyaz better word in sanskrit is sadhana okay so um basically what i figured is your throat is also like a muscle yes in the same way that you do your hatha yoga which is your yes, asanas yes, yes. which kind of makes your body flexible stronger uh riyas sadhna these things are able to work your throat yeah. and you're able to have more practice control. makes you perfect okay parallelly i'd like to state that music is what feelings sound like yes that's one of the ways that music as a concept is described like today if an alien race visited earth and didn't have a concept of music in their own culture this is probably how we'd explain music to them that you know we feel certain things that we're not able to express through words and that comes out as music through these instruments in the western world there is something called as music healing So you must have heard about yeah. it. So let's say you are unwell. So if you actually listen to certain music for so many hours a day, you will be surprised that element goes away. In mm-hmm. fact, I read a very interesting research paper. If you have a health element, listen to a particular music for ten minutes every day for one month, and before after you check the disease, you will be surprised it goes away. Why is the Samved entirely about music? Like, what so, is in it? so because music is such an internal part of our civilization human race that without music we cannot survive so let me give an example sure so let's say you're watching a movie one of the very important elements of a movie is background music because it makes you feel a certain way the emotions hmm. are invoked like let's say we are making this video with lot of background music you will feel connected to it if it is very bland and plain you will say okay you lose interest that's why actually background music is very important part of film making film editing or any form of creativity any creativity mm. so think about you know without music you cannot survive on this particular planet mm. and let me tell you even though you're logical western research has proven it we need to be emotionally intelligent that's where bhajan comes in so you need to have emotions and you should have intelligence also mm. so bhajans invoke that particular thing that's why you have this different musical instruments different ragas and they invoke those particular bhav in you yeah um you know i hear you sir and i understand it and i've absorbed it i still don't understand how an entire veda can be just about music maybe it's because of my limited musical understanding and i know that it's an unlimited subject yes so i would say my knowledge is also limited but think about our rishis they whole, wrote a whole veda on only music uh, you know does the uh, samveda also contain some sort of bhajans i'm assuming so bhajans is a format that we use today in our generation okay but understanding the musical notes what we call sare gama pada nisa and their different formats so i would say do re mi it's it's the indian version of it yes, okay. so westerners have a beautiful idea of you know getting into details so there are different notes different scales mm. so the same thing has been done in our way but the difference is for us music was a connection to god not just a performance Mm. So if music can't reach you, God, then what kind of music is it? What's the point? Point the point. And Bharat Muni, another great Rishi, who actually wrote the Natya Shastra, talks about Sama Veda in detail. Mm. So maybe we can get a music expert to speak on Sama Veda. Okay, let's talk about the next Veda for now. So Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda. Okay. Lot of rituals that we talk about. It's there in Yajur Veda. Okay. So you know we have a great culture in India, and one of the philosophies is called Mimamsa. What? Invo- Mimamsa philosophy. Maybe we can have a separate discussion on the nine Indian philosophies. Okay. Vedanta is just one of them. What is Vedanta? The word. Okay. So if we look at it, if we split the word Ved and Anta, the essence of the Vedas is called Vedanta, which is primarily written in the Upanishads. Like the summary of the Vedas. Summary of the Vedas. Essence of the Vedas. What does that mean? So let me put it this way: like four Vedas we are talking about, they are sub-classified into another four Ved sub-categories. Like each has its own yes. four sub-categories. So they are called the uh, you know the Samhitas, Arinakas, Brahmanas, and Upanishads. So Upanishad is a discussion between the Guru and the Sishya, and there are eighteen okay. main Upanishads, and now new Upanishads have been discovered, and there are more than hundred and eight. Upanishads. It's sort of maybe sequels to the Vedas to understand the Vedas better. So it's like this, you know. Let me put it in an example. Let's say you go to a doctor who has studied all the medical science, 
now you are not interested in studying the whole uh, knowledge of the medical science which the doctor must have spent 4 years to understand mm. you want an immediate solution and you say yaar mera pet dukh raha hai my stomach is aching there is some problem now you give me the essence of your knowledge so what he the doctor or she will do is sub- prescribe you some pills or medicine mm. so that's an essence mm. that doesn't mean he only can do that he has done research for so many years mm. so if spirituality in india the philosophy of india can be summarized in essence that is vedanta mm. okay so the essence of the vedas is vedanta which is contained in the upanishads mm. wow okay this is like a subject that just keeps getting unpacked uh but keeping in mind the occult theme of the show we've got to get to the fourth veda yeah the fourth veda the highlight of this episode so uh i don't even know where do you where do you begin explaining what occult even means otherworldly ghosts demons there's so many occult elements in our culture that i don't know where to begin it probably begins in the atharva ved yes it does uh i know it's a subject that fascinates you as well have you gotten to reading the yes, atharva ved yes, yourself yes yes how did they start it so let me put the other way chanakya was a person who studied the atharva veda and he wrote the artha shastra in the artha shastra there are lot of occult practices which are derived from the atharva yes in fact it is called the fourth veda till chanakya's time it was only three vedas so one of the readings so one of the scholars said uh, rigved samved and yajurved were actually the original vedas the fourth got added you know a lot of people don't believe in it that is a personal choice but in our country even today the occult practices happen okay they are dark they are you know undercurrent but they do happen where do they happen so they happen in lot of families and i have seen lot of politicians using it really of course and let me tell you next time when you have elections going around you'll be surprised these politicians used lot of these occult practices because they're in the power game yeah let's let's just talk about tantricism yeah is it correct to say tantricism is an occult practice yes there are elements of occult in tantra what is tantra what is the word tantra mean so there are uh, mantra yantra and tantra mantras what we spoke about yes. which are the uh, words to invoke yes. blessings of frequencies what's a yantra yantra is a instrument like a weapon or yeah, yeah. even uh, let's say you know we have some instrument that we use so that is yantra like for example mobile uh, phone is a yantra okay and there are yantras in ancient hinduism yeah there is shri yantra what is that so it's a very interesting go and google it shri yantra is a powerful yantra you can invoke uh, uh, goddess lakshmi through that goddess lakshmi means wealth wealth can... yeah if you want to be powerful especially with money yeah. money is wealth power would you say the equivalent in the modern day are these like crystals pinchu and all those yes yeah, absolutely the crystals yantras, would be yeah. a yantra yes and tantra is the process you know I, i speaking about crystals i've never understood the exact logic but i will say this that the first time i ever saw a crystal shop in goa it was a tiny horrible looking shop but i was just so drawn to it i didn't know why just those crystals hold some sort of positive vibe and they supposed to have different purposes we've kept some here some mm. in my room and i do feel it changes the energy yes, of it does, it does, your it space does, it does it does um but that's a yantra and this is one for a yantra i'm sure like a um rudraksh should be yes, another yantra yes yes it is uh what does a rudraksh do like why does and it even have if you look at pyramids being kept in many places they attract energies okay like you mean egypt and the mayan pyramids not only that i think any triangular structure you must have seen a lot of houses in india having pyramids being kept i mean even many temples that are yes, made in yes, india yes yes like, yes what, maybe there are some if you look at the kalash the top of the temple they are in a particular format made of certain metals Hmm. So next time you go to a temple, a good ancient architectural temple, you'll be surprised. You'll have a kalash on the top. Again, the reason science doesn't agree with all this is because there hasn't been enough scientific research that's done about this. I'm sure if and you go and measure the electromagnetism there, oh. you might find some differences. I mean, uh, we've just not seen enough research yet because we're not looking at it scientifically. Till our parents' generation, when we went to a temple, it was matter of faith. Mm. but today it's a matter of logic to so look at all the temple architecture logically scientifically and measure it it's actually energy management okay okay uh, are you familiar with rudrakshas yes what is the purpose of a rudraksh so rudraksh as you know is a seed of a tree and you know it is generally connected with lord shiva so we call him a rudra avatar and you know shivji and their bhaktas use rudraksh a lot 
and it has been proven scientifically also that people who do chanting on rudraksha mala actually get those energies in fact there are cases where they wear the rudraksha mala also get those energies uh, you mean like you get the blessings of shiva in the same way that a mantra yes. a shiva mantra yes, would get you yes. shiva's blessings yes, yes. just by wearing a rudraksha meditating yes, upon yes, it yes. able to attract it better yes and don't make it a style icon lot of people like to wear it and show it off that's not the point yes you can also show it off you can wear it it's like you know saying that let's say you keep an ice on your body it does have an effect on your body and the mind also cooling effect mm. in the same way all these yantras actually have an effect on your body also yeah like in islam there's tawiz is tawiz concept it's probably the same thing it's it's a form of a yantra yes what i do want to ask you is black magic like things like kala jadu where uh i mean you know you always hear of these stories even in cities where someone's given someone else like a pendant to wear or something to wear like a bracelet to wear and then stuff starts going wrong yes, yes, yes. for that person yes. like i actually had a cousin who had an experience where someone had given him a bracelet to wear and he started getting horrible injuries and eventually someone from his uh, mom side of the family told him that why are you wearing that they were able to spot something in that bracelet yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, kind of made him take it off and did like a bit of a some some kind of a puja on him he claims that his life got much better, better after better, that yeah. but uh, that would be like a yantra used for something negative negative yes but you know when you do so called kala jadu on someone is there some sort of a gain for you as the practitioner of kala jadu but that's a selfish gain so you are trying to destroy somebody else for your benefit and a lot of people still do that especially those people who are jealous don't want the other person to succeed in fact what i like about you especially your generation is very collaborative if you like to work with another youtuber you don't feel insecure saying that okay let me work with this guy let me help him or her and she may indirectly or directly help you also so i would say go beyond competition you know in uh, a few generations ago there was a theory called survival of the fittest so if you succeed i am at loss so how do i make you go down so one of this is occult practices mm. but luckily for our generation it is teamwork if you succeed i am happy and your success may lead to my success mm. so i think this is a very negative way that's why it's called tamasic vidya mm. not a very great thing but you are right i also know of cases sometimes when you go on the road be careful next time you will see some lemon being there or maybe some you know vegetable with some colors around it and all don't go near it you mean like a plastic bag yes really yeah don't even go behind it you never know what they have invoked and put it on the road you see this a lot in indian cities oh especially tied to cities really like yeah. you just see some food lying down on the yes, road in yes, yes. a closed plastic bag i have always assumed that someone's left it for beggars to eat no 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 you never know so something which is unknown because what power they have put into that you don't know what is what is the way to protect yourself against black magic is it just a spiritual path and meditation very beautiful question and i'll tell you a simple answer your spiritual guru can save you from black magic so suppose you get that feeling that you know somebody is trying this on you you should have a guru or at least go and chant some positive mantra i know of an example where a person actually it was in a western culture okay this particular person in their particular country was using black magic and immediately he did not know what to do and you know in the western culture they use cross as a positive symbol so he wore the cross and started chanting you know the the name of hymns of jesus believe me he came out so the way to attack negativity is not use more negativity but stay positive and if you have a guru you know there are a lot of signs you start getting nightmares so nightmares if you get what do you do so and if it is continuously getting repeated i know of a case a child he used to get up at 1 o'clock in the night continuously and used to scream and this child maybe one day two day it was looking like a nightmare and the mother and the father got really worried and the child was hardly 4 years old so she could not express what the problem was that so they went to doctors and they went to psychologist and as there is a beautiful saying when allopathy doesn't work when homeopathy doesn't work then tirupati works <laughs> so they went to this family priest in india every particular family will have a priest it is called kula guru not cool guru kula guru <laughs> and the kula guru saw this and think somebody is using some black magic against this child and it was a real case so what is the solution so they said you no know, let us do this particular puja so they did a counter thing 
not against that person to make that negativity come back and believe me after that puja was completed that whole uh, nightmare started going away and she could sleep peacefully do dreams and nightmares hold any significance in our culture 100% in our indian culture it is very clear that what you dream is actually part of your being okay let me break that down so there's a concept called sharir traya yeah. which means that anyone's body or anyone's sense of self is made up of three parts yes the physical body uh, which is sthul sthul sharir. sharir the um, the astral body which is sort of your ghost yeah that is the sukshma sharir and the karan sharir which is your causal body or yes. your soul yes. it's just yes. this is vedanta light. this is vedanta okay and this whole concept is called sharir traya yeah so now continue sir so it's related to the astral body that's what you're trying to say yes yes okay so your body is not only this body today we have aura readings also Mm. so that colors of aura mm. in fact now in the western world they have started discovering instruments to measure your aura okay so if you are a satvik person more on the spiritual side you know there is an element we can measure it's more white in color if you are on darker side you can make out so lord i have met sages mahatmas by looking at your body they can tell you that you are not a nice person or a nice person like for example you know certain people when you meet you don't connect to them because they say the vibes don't match what do you mean by vibes the thought process doesn't match somewhere you feel you know repulsive or sometimes you feel attracted and that's why it's very important to know that you know this karan sharir sukshma sharir and sthula sharir are all interrelated so coming back to your dreams it's actually what you believe yourself and what you think about in the day time when you are awake it is a reflection of what you see in the night time okay so that's why the counter to it is positive affirmations the law of attraction so if you chant the affirmations you know even our culture we call it mantras okay hmm. so if you use it all these negative thoughts will go away and you become a positive person hmm. sort of like the gym for your soul yes absolutely hmm. mental gym hmm. you know let's end with one uh, kind of question i've had for a while recently which is the spine and its role in our culture its role in spiritualism people don't understand how important a role your spine and your back plays in your own spiritual growth parallelly let's briefly speak about kundalini as well so uh would i don't know would you like to begin in this fact, that is my current topic of research kundalini kundalini and spine let's let's kind of give the listener some perspective if someone doesn't know anything about what we're talking about okay. so spine in indian culture is called as meru danda okay meru danda meru means the center danda means your spine which is like a danda or a bone you will be surprised if you are they say if your spine is fit you are healthy mm. that's why the biggest and the most perfect exercise according to indian culture or yoga is surya namaskar and there are people whom i know and probably you must have heard who do 108 surya namaskars per day what is the most the whole body get exercised but most more is the spine so today research has been done about spine being you know being the most important part of your body and also the gut it is not just the brain mm. all these are interconnected mm. coming back to kundalini there are seven chakras it starts from below and it goes up till here mm. but it's all through the spinal root mm. so they are very subtle you can't see them but the westerners have already started doing research on that yeah it, i think it coincides with important uh, organs and glands yes, uh, yes. in your body yes. for example your throat chakra is at the same place as your thyroid gland yes, yes. um uh, your third eye chakra is at the same place as your pineal gland yes um uh, your heart chakra is at the same place as your yes. heart yes. solar plexus is at the same place as your stomach yes uh your peace chakra your hara chakra is at the same place as your uh, intestine your gut yeah and your sex chakra your lowest chakra is at the same place as your sex organ yes uh so that's the kind of uh, uh western analogy on no, chakras in fact since you brought out my health issue hmm. you know actually i was advised by a spiritual guru that my uh, solar plexus has to be you know invoked so i used to do pranayam every day and the day i threw up actually all my toxins came out and the chakra got clear so it's detoxification Okay. so sometimes sickness is good mm yeah that that's why when you know you fall ill when there's a change of seasons yes a lot of people look down upon that thought they say it's unsigned how can you say that the change of season actually makes you fall ill ayurved says that it does it's basically your body getting detoxified uh, detoxified releasing yes. your toxins yes. through your sneezing absolutely. through your coughs absolutely absolutely 
सो द एलिमेंट्स गोज अवे एंड इट प्युरिफाइज यू एंड कुंडलिनी शास्त्र इज पार्ट ऑफ योग शास्त्र कुंडलिनी शास्त्र आई एम अज्यूमिंग अ मिस्टिकल एलिमेंट ऑफ योगा कुंडलिनी सपोज टू बी अ पूल ऑफ एनर्जी दैट्स हिडन इनसाइड एवरी ह्यूमन एवरी ह्यूमन बींग एंड दे से दैट एट द मोमेंट ऑफ मोक्ष एट द मोमेंट यू अचीव निर्वाणा योर कुंडलिनी राइजेज थ्रू योर स्पाइन and joins with your third eye chakra your ajna chakra yeah. uh, and that's kind of the next human form like when we think that we have reached a final state of evolution there is one more stage but i want to tell you a story about this i know of a highly evolved management guru mm. okay and he was in gujarat very great motivational speaker he was and one day he was dead so when the wife went to him immediately in the morning he was lying dead she called the doctor so the doctor analyzed it and he is no more but the analysis given from a western standpoint was that you know he had a brain hemorrhage but the wife did not accept it saying that you know now i know the reason of his death so the wife was telling me actually one uh, yogi had told him when he was alive that you will get moksha and you will die in a spiritual state of mind so from a western perspective the whole blood came and you know he had this uh, brain hemorrhage and that's why he died but from a spiritual angle that's the kundalini that awoke and he left through this particular part and let me tell you friends if you look at all small babies have you touched their this part of it they are very soft if you have a baby less than 1 year in your family just hold the baby and test this part you will be surprised this particular skull over here has got a pathway to enter and exit so if you can exit your prana through this particular path your kundalini has awakened and you will get 100% get moksha in hindu culture every god brings their own blessings for example if you pray to hanuman ji you're supposed to get gain strength gain humility gain mental strength and stability uh if you pray to shiva uh you gain power you gain a sense of detachment uh when you pray to mata or the mother god in hinduism one what i want to say is you're supposed to pray to her for extremely lofty material gains if you want to gain power if you want to have that next big jump in your life but two if you're going to pray to her you need to understand that it's energy that cannot be handled by everyone this is what i have understood and you have to work your way up you can't just directly pray to her. you have to probably pray to other gods first and then earn your right to pray to her uh some people naturally sense sort of a uh, an attraction to praying to mata so i'll explain that to you yeah. in the bhagavad gita chapter 17 talks about this mata energy not exactly mata but the kind of a prayers you do okay so they say the satvik people the pure souls pray to gods so everything is about let's say hanuman ji ram ji and all those things but the people in between who are rajasik who want power will pray to demi gods not gods so demi gods are yaksha uh, kinnaras gandharvas they are not fully gods but they are not fully human beings also but they have certain powers and there is nothing wrong in being rajasik it depends on no it depends on your nature mm. and the last is called tamasik they will pray to ghost they will pray to dead bodies so the people who are actually wanting the lowest powers that's where their sexuality part of it they practice all these in smashan in mm. lot of you know negative places where if you are a pure person you go you cannot connect mm. but if you want to evolve it's better to start by praying to the gods because that is the satvik one but there are people in the society who pray pray to demi gods where, where do you think this prayer to mata fits in is it is it so it again depends on which mata are you invoking okay so you know there are so many people within devi is also there are formats mm. like you know tantra is a part of devi puja also Mm. So certain devis can give you that, mm. but so when you say Mata for me, my first thing about Mata is my mother who is pure, who loves me unconditionally. What what is the element of your own parents in Hindu culture? And that, that's what I love about India that it celebrates parenthood so much, which oh, is why we very, don't leave very, our parents. Very clear. In fact, we are talking about Vedas. In fact, Upanishads. You should study the Upanishad and Taittiriya Upanishad. is a very interesting upanishad for young generation students in that he says after you pass out graduation ceremony you should pray to four people throughout your life matru devo bhava pitru devo bhava acharya devo bhava and atithi devo bhava your mother mother your father, father your teacher acharya and atithi your visitor guest your guest 
you know today everybody wants to go to meet somebody only after taking an appointment but mm. if somebody comes and rings the bell you don't like it why have you come but he may be coming in a god's format or a god may be coming in his format mm. so sometimes unplanned guest can be an opportunity for success mm. so the importance in our indian culture is that parents mother is your first guru father is your second guru teacher in the school college or gurukul is your third guru and anybody and everybody who comes is your guru forever mahabharata says this you know the downfall of the mighty so there is a question being asked why do the mighty fall because they have not respected elders and if you respect elders a common man can also become a billionaire or a successful person rkp sir mm-hmm. another fantastic episode more uh, to go yeah uh don't have much to say to you i said the same thing to luke coutinho there's nothing i could say to you that i've not already said so thank you for being on the show again what i'd ask uh, the listeners and the viewers to do is drop your comments what other topics would you like us to break down rk pisa is an all star on trs and he's going to be back any last message for the viewers sir uh, study your own scriptures <laughs> okay there's a lot to unpack lots you're only looking at the tip of the iceberg mm. deep within all that we are covering is nothing but our own great indian culture and i would go to the extent of telling you know it's a global culture yeah across the globe wherever you are listening to this particular show try to study the wisdom of the ages and you will be a different person with a purpose mm. rkp sir thank you once again so that was the episode for today one of the practices that we've begun on this podcast is that we cut it into clips and we upload it on our highlights channel and TRS clips as a channel has even more content sometimes than the actual podcast because the podcast we tailor make for the podcast audience so if you want even more knowledge you've got to go check out TRS clips as for this conversation there's nothing about Dr RKP that I haven't already said I want you guys to tell me in the comment section DM me tell me what other topics you'd like us to break down we have a ritual of meeting every 6 months and exchanging ideas just like this i hope you enjoyed today's conversation For conversations just like this makes you follow us on spotify every episode's available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world beer biceps and these collaborations with dr radhakrishnan pillai will be back very very soon mm-hmm.